Policy Matters is a conversation platform which aims to provide reasoned analysis and context to the activities, reforms, and policies of the federal government of Ethiopia. Exploring various reforms the government is undertaking, the conversation platform aspires to enable nuanced and informed understanding. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this edition of uh, uh, Policy Matters. Just to begin with, um, Dr. Getacho, there were a, a very uh, serious reform uh, package uh, from uh, the new administration back in uh, June uh, 2018, uh, and even uh, before that, since April uh, 2018. Uh, but what were like the, the baseline or uh, the background when this administration uh, uh, took charge in, 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 in that period? How do you uh, assess uh, the uh, existing uh, uh, state of uh, media in general. Okay. Thank you very much, Solomon. Uh, you know, as soon as Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed was swor sw sworn in uh, as uh, Prime Minister in uh, April uh, 2018, in his uh, inaugural speech, he made it clear that there was democratic deficit in the country and uh, he also made it very clear that uh, the media were among the very important pillars for a democratic system to thrive. He said, I remember, that uh, democracy without a free and vibrant media would be unthinkable. So uh, he, the, his government embarked on reforming the, the political space in general, and uh, four areas of reform were prioritized, and among these is one among these four would be uh, media along with uh, electoral law, the, the uh, civil society's uh, regulation, and uh, anti-terrorism law. So, um, I mean, these four areas of reform work, working together were believed to bring about a significant amount of difference in the, in the democratic space, in the democratic exercises in the country. So government did not spend much time before uh, bringing together uh, a panel of like a group of top level lawyers, very experienced lawyers, uh, chaired by Professor Tlau uh, from Addis Ababa Law, Law School, Addis Ababa University Law School. Uh, that council had 13 members, all experienced lawyers and lawyers. So, uh, and then the, the, this council, they were accountable to the Attorney General's office, and then what they did was they decided to come up with different uh, working groups. And then one working group was the, the media task force that you chaired, I think, uh, constituted of 15 top level independent uh, media professionals, lawyers, practitioners, academic. Uh, they came together to deliberate on the, the media landscape in the country and uh, they started off by conducting a very important diagnostic study. And uh, the finding, one of the findings I remember of the diagnostic study was that uh, the, during the time of EPRDF, the media were crippled. Uh, of course, regulations existed, but they didn't materialize. The, the, the regulations themselves uh, uh, had uh, some problems. They stifled the space uh, the, the, in general for the media and uh, freedom of expression. Um, so the media during the time of EPRDF where uh, the, the Ethiopian media were among, uh, among the worst in terms of the level of uh, uh, respecting freedom of expression in the media, international uh, standards, international like indexes of press freedom attest to this, uh, we were one of the worst, uh, and then Ethiopia was labeled as among the, 
the worst jailers of journalists and then the space for journalists to operate freely was also very limited. So they started to work against these backdrops, against this background. Uh, so I think uh, you guys did a very good job of engaging, uh, engaging all the, the stakeholders and making the process very open and participatory. And it all started like that. Uh, they, they brought uh, findings of the study uh, to public attention, the stakeholders came together, deliberated on it, and then had to, uh, you know, make their own comments on it, some inputs, provided some inputs, and then the study was enriched. And that, that created the basis for the upcoming, for the subsequent uh, drafting process of, of the the, the media policy and the media law. In fact, the media policy uh, started a bit, uh, a bit earlier uh, with the former government communication affairs office and then uh, my own office, Ethiopian Broadcast Authority, inherited the process. And then uh, as opposed to the previous exercises, we started to make it very open. Um, and then uh, we brought together uh, all concerned parties, uh, including media practitioners, media owners, academics, and then uh, that's how it, in, in fact, we were also supported by consultants, both international and local consultants, and they carried out a study and brought their findings to our uh, attention, and then the, the media policy drafting process also started that way. So in principle, it is a media policy that comes first, uh, and then the, the media law aligns itself with the, the, the policy because the policy statement is uh, the intent of the government. It shows the intent of the government. It, in broad sense, shows a relationship between the media and society. So what kind of uh, normative theory of media would you like to follow? Uh, will it be liberal? Will it be social responsibility theory? Like in the past, during the EPRDF uh, rule, um, there was an attempt in drafting media policies, uh, and then, or difficult to call it media policy per se, but in, in key uh, policy documents of the EPRDF, you would find uh, you would find statements and uh, some ideas that indicate to media policy. So overall, like the overriding, overarching uh, principle during that time was in, in the kind of democracy, the kind of ideology they chose was uh, revolutionary democracy. So they wanted the media to have uh, a normative policy which goes with the, the, uh, the ideology of the day, which is revolutionary democracy. So developmental type of journalism was prescribed, especially the state media, the public media, and uh, those media outlets who had affiliation with the, the government uh, were required to follow that variant of journalism. So there was no freedom for the media and the practitioners to, to uh, choose what works, what variant of journalism works for the country. So in the current policy, uh, we wanted to make sure that there was no prescription whatsoever, no prescription whatsoever. So uh, we had to make sure that, uh, so it all had to come from the process and from the discussions. We started to, we were very open to international practices and uh, standards. Part of the study was a, a comparative study of international uh, practices like you did in, in, the, in the media regulation drafting process. Yep. Um, just I think you could speak more uh, to the process of I mean, drafting. Um, it was the, two, the policy and um, uh, the legal uh, framework or the drafting process, even if it was conducted by two independent teams at the end of the day, uh, they both see that there was leaning towards uh, uh, 
making uh, media subservient to the interests of uh, the ruling party, if not uh, so much the, the instrumental aspects of the media and, uh, that the independent existent and that it has like an embedded um, autonomy. Uh, that it's also linked to society and it, it has also a role uh, to ensure government's accountability. They both uh, share and uh, at the end of the day, it was not very difficult to harmonize uh, the policy uh, with uh, the, the existing uh, uh, draft. Uh, but uh, with all that, and um, uh, I also want to emphasize that it was um, a comprehensive reform and when the media reform uh, was uh, uh, being uh, done. There are other uh, parallel reforms for exactly. civil, society civil society and others, and it was uh, helping even to to actually ensure that the process was very open and uh, transparency in, in in the process. Uh, so uh, yes, but with that finding and with this uh, regulation, uh, how do you see uh, uh, the? I mean, after two years of work. How do you see today um, uh, the, the impact of the policy and also the, the ongoing law and what kind of uh, changes are now uh, being achieved or in the process of being implemented? Good question. I think the change is huge and it starts with the commitment of uh, the government. The government uh, has been very serious and uh, my prime minister has been very clear and cons consistent with the uh, freedom uh, that the media uh, needs to be granted. It's the media deserved that sort of, they needed it, they deserved that sort of freedom uh, for them to be able to, in a meaningful way, uh, play their role in the process of democratization in general. So it's not like uh, you're not uh, doing the media a favor by granting them their right. They needed it, they deserved it. They needed to be free uh, for, for the, the country's need to democratize itself is to materialize. Uh, you need that kind of uh, political space. So uh, one way you can show your commitment to a changed political space is by liberalizing the media. And that is exactly what happened. And uh, uh, in fact, before the, the policy was drafted and even before the law was uh, made, the government already started to show commitment. And then uh, this has been witnessed by the international community. community. If you take the, the ranking in the or press freedom index uh, we've shown 51 uh, 51 uh, levels of of change this is a it's a leap it's a huge leap by all standards unprecedented type of change uh, witnessed by C international organs like uh, cpj so they said ethiopia has shown a remarkable uh, difference in its respect to press freedom. That's in, in recognition uh, to this uh, freedom, they, they decided to, uh, to make uh, the observing of International Press Freedom Day in Ethiopia, was observed in Ethiopia, so a couple of years ago. So uh, that did not come by chance. And then uh, this is you cannot think of uh, the international community to convene in Ethiopia and then uh, celebrate the press freedom change Ethiopia has shown. So already started and then we went into this process of uh, drafting the frameworks uh, to, to make this initiative lasting, you know, this commitment of the government lasting uh, I think this uh, policy and the media law, they are statements of reaffirmation of uh, the commitment the government had already shown. And then, uh, obviously, changes are already there. Government, since then, uh, has, not, has not jailed journalists for uh, expressing for carrying out their journalistic tasks. Uh, journalists are to, uh, they are free to express their views, uh, 
um, so they are legally protected, and uh, the the policy says that, and then uh, they, it's also indicated very very clearly, and in, in the in the draft media proclamation. So among among the changes, the the media law and the media policy brought about, uh, it was the intent to restructure. Uh, reconstitute my own organization as independent and impartial organization, which is uh, the media regulatory body, uh, Ethiopian Broadcast Authority. So the way it will be restructured would be different from the past. Maybe just to give uh, a, a background, I mean, there have been so many uproar about the performance of the, the, the previous uh, EBA. Uh, when it comes to, even if it's uh, uh, constituted as, as an independent regulatory body, it was part of the apparatus that actually used uh, media to suppress and also intervene in, in their activities. So against that uh, backdrop, uh, how do you see the restructuring also in, in comparative aspect? Exactly. We, you know, people were very skeptical about what EBA had been doing in the past you know, going after the media uh, and uh, putting heavy hands on them, uh, like uh, firm control of the, the space. So which did not, which worked negatively, uh, you know, just did not help the media to grow uh, as free, responsible and uh, vibrant in institutions. So they, you know, the, the accusation that the media were crippled and the government had a role in it comes from these kinds of practices. The legislation itself, the legislation we had in the past, uh, which is uh, 533, uh, 2007, proclamation number 533, 2007, uh, in its provisions um, did not uh, grant the media the, the kind of freedom they deserve it in its licensing, uh, in its uh, regulation practices, uh, in the way it's formed, the way it's accountable, uh, you know, attests to this skepticism, this uh, accusation that it was very much government dependent or, you know, very much closely attached with the executive body of the government. Uh, like in the past when it was formed, uh, the, the institution was accountable to Ministry of Information. And then when Ministry of Dis Deform Information was gone, dissolved, and then uh, it uh, became accountable to the Prime Minister's office. Again, another, uh, another executive body. But lately in the new policy, and uh, in the draft proclamation, it's going to be, it's going to report to the parliament, the House of People's Representatives. So in terms of accountability, it's very accountability different from the executive body. Uh, it's, it, it follows a different line. It's new thing, a new practice. And also uh, in the appointment of the, the leaders of the institution, in the past, it was the prime minister that uh, appoints, appointed the uh, heads and deputy or deputy director generals of the an institution. Uh, so this time around, um, it is uh, it's it's the parliament which is responsible. It has a board. The board recruits uh, able professionals, independent people with integrity, with expertise, with experiences and knowledge in the media discipline, they will be recruited by the board, which is also another independent body, uh, and then presented to the parliament. When the parliament endorses, that is how the director general and the deputies are appointed. And it's, it's made very clear in the policy and draft proclamation that they will never be party members. They would not have a key role in the party structures. They should be responsible, fit, uh, independent experts. And then also the board. It will have a nine member board, uh, all able, again, uh, diverse in their profession, 
but most of them come in from the media disciplines, both the academic and practices and uh, legal backgrounds, uh, you know, areas of expertise appropriate to, to the, the discipline. And they are required again to be, uh, to stay away from uh, party structures and people who are not very closely associated with uh, party structures. And nine members, uh, uh, six of them, come from civil society uh, organizations, academia and uh, the media um, the media themselves, while three of them, only three of them come from the government. This is another very strong statement on the part of the government, uh, a very, very important gesture and uh, level of seriousness from the government. There is no intention of uh, putting uh, the hierarchy, you know, the, the leaders, both in the board and in the, in the secretariat, who are close to the government. So government is ready to let it go and then uh, lead, lead the industry by itself. And this is a very important step another thing in relation to the, the, the role of EBA is um, the role of uh, media self-regulation. The sector itself uh, were not there administratively, politically, and also uh, legally. Now, one of the responsibilities of EBA is also help uh, work in when, when it comes to ethical and professional matters with the sector, the industry uh, peer uh, review mechanism itself. So part of this regulation, we're going to follow a co-regulatory model. In the past, it was government. You know, I should uh, keep an eye on every media activity. But hereafter, the government is not going to act like that. In fact, uh, the government is ready to allow the industry to regulate uh, you know, its practices by itself. Uh, so the, the, the self-regulatory mechanisms like the media council, the media associations, uh, government will actually, uh, when it's invited, help in strengthening these structures. So they will be very supportive and then when they function, when they do, do their job very well, they will be very supportive of the government uh, uh, tasks. So we welcome those self-regulatory uh, mechanisms and we are here to support them. Uh, this was not the case in the past. It, government itself wanted to constitute a self-regulatory <laughs> institution. Well, Maybe another uh, very fundamental uh, change I would say is um, uh, the plan uh, to allow up to 25% uh, uh, of ownership in, in, in the media uh, uh, to uh, foreigners. In the past, the policy direction was very clear that they are seen as a suspect and that they, are, they will interfere in, in the homegrown uh, uh, democracy. So uh, how do you see uh, the role of this injection of foreign capital and skill and also share in, in, in the investment landscape? You know, there is change in our outlook toward the, uh, you know, uh, foreigners and especially to the Ethiopian diaspora. We see them as allies. Uh, we would like to benefit from their expertise. And also we want them to inject uh, some finances. Media um, is capital intensive industry. And then uh, there is a lot of com competition going on and uh, the technology, it keeps changing. So we, we want our media to keep pace with the changing, uh, you know, with the changing pace, to, with the pace of technology change. So if they get, if they get support, uh, controlled kind of support, limited amount of support uh, from the outside world, that would be a welcome. At the same time, you don't want the media landscape to be dominated and then uh, also uh, conglomerates take, come in and taking over a uh, very infant, yet to grow industry in the country. So we have learned from the international experiences that uh, the percentage varies. Uh, some countries 20%, some others 40, they allow up to 40% uh, involvement 
participation of foreign capitals and foreigners. So in, in our case, in the draft proclamation and policy, we want to limit it to 25%, and we'll see what the parliament is going to say on that. Yeah. Maybe one last point. Um, the long overdue um, commitment to uh, decriminalize defamation is already agreed on uh, uh, both the policy and uh, uh, the law, and also EBS ways of uh, taking measure from the previous very punitive and uh, sanction-oriented uh, uh, approach. Now there is like a step-by-step -step approach to uh, administrative uh, regulation and also access to appeal uh, to uh, court of uh, justice. How do you see that uh, from the previous yeah, experience? The, the, you know, the, uh, broadly speaking, in the past, the approach was more of control rather than support. But these days, it's more of support rather than control. Uh, so we want to give the support a chance. Uh, all the way from capacity building, uh, part of it has got to do with lack of uh, uh, expertise. And one big gap we have, one big challenge we have is with a lack of professionalism. So we in, will embark on a lot of capacity building. We have already been doing this and uh, we'll intensify that. We'll uh, build on what, we've been, uh, what we have achieved so far. So more capacity building interventions uh, so as more understanding is created and on, on the part of the officials and the general public do a, more of media liter literacy. And then don't get me wrong, uh, uh, defamation is still a big challenge in, in our country. But criminalizing it was the, in the past we used to criminalize, uh, penalize, if you get involved in one one incidence of uh, uh, defamation uh, over, and then you will be accused. Uh, there were, there were uh, provisions in the legal frameworks allowing uh, the, the government and the prosecutors to, uh, you know, to, to, to go into court. Uh, but this time around, it's less of that you know, keep the, the, the legal measures, the, the harsh legal measure, measures uh, very far. And then in as much as possible, uh, use up all other alternatives, starting from the self-regulatory mechanisms to administrative, administrative, uh, administrative measures that are restricted, if, even EBS role, EBS role is limited now, it's controlled. Because it's a regulatory body, uh, it cannot take every kind of measure it wants to on, on the media because, because they violated one ethical standard. So this, you know, you give them a chance and it's on the, on the basis of their track record and their performance in the past and also based on the chances that you give them that you start to use those kinds of uh, legal uh, provisions. After uh, using all other means of educating them, all other administrative, uh, less punitive uh, administrative uh, provisions, and it's all only in, in the very last that you will, you will be forced to use those kinds of measures. As a lawyer, if you have uh, one or two points to say on that one, that would be good. I hope uh, that uh, both the policy uh, and the law uh, would be instrumental and they would serve as a springboard uh, to create a very um, vibrant, uh, professional and uh, uh, strong uh, uh, media that knows its boundary and also uh, promotes uh, uh, the interest of uh, uh, the public and uh, hope that they will also serve to uh, resuscitate uh, the damage uh, that has done uh, to the media in the previous uh, uh, three decades and that uh, they will all uh, soon um, uh, start to be implemented in, uh, uh, as, as planned and as envisaged uh, in the policy. Uh, uh, it was a pleasure uh, talking to you, Dr. Uh, uh, Getacho, and uh, thank you for uh, making time out of your busy schedule uh, to be here uh, with us. Uh, thank you very much. My pleasure, Solomon.